If I drop a piece of sodium metal into a gas jar of chlorine, we have a very exothermic reaction and I will form the compound sodium chloride, more commonly known as salt. Sodium chloride is an example of an ionic compound and it exists as an ionic lattice. I'm sure we're all familiar with this classic model of an ionic lattice. We've got the chlorine and sodium existing as discrete ions. We've got a nice regular arrangement in this particular lattice. Each sodium ion is surrounded by six chloride ions and vice versa. As I said, this is an exceedingly exothermic reaction. The formation of a sodium chloride lattice is very favorable. And yet, when we calculate the energy it takes to um, break up a lattice or the energy release when we form a lattice, sometimes the experimental and the theoretical values are very, very different. So in this video, we are going to try and get to the bottom of why that might be. Where is it that our model for an ionic lattice is not 100% up to scratch? The evidence for our ionic lattice model comes from X-ray crystallography or X-ray diffraction studies. And we have here an electron density map for the compound lithium fluoride. It reads very much like any other map. We have got electron density concentrated around the nuclei of the ions. That would be the fluoride ion. And here we've got the lithium ion. The electron density virtually falls to zero between the ions. And this is consistent with our model of ionic bonding in which an electron is transferred from lithium. So lithium loses an electron to the fluorine, which gains the electron to form oppositely charged ions. If we bring two oppositely charged ions together, they will attract. And the strength of this electrostatic attraction is strongest the closer they are to each other. We can represent this on this graph or plot. So if I have energy on my y-axis, in kilojoules per mole, zero, which means that if we are going upwards up the y-axis, positive movement, we have got an endothermic reaction. If we're falling away from zero, an exothermic reaction. And this will be um, distance between our two nuclei, between well, let's keep with our sodium chloride between the sodium and the chloride nuclei. And we would see, let me just change my colour here, we would see that as the ions come closer together, the attraction is stronger, and as a result of that, energy is released. However, we also know that the ions are not going to get closer and closer and closer together until they collapse on each other. That's not what our model predicts and that's not what our electron density maps are showing us. There must be some force of repulsion between the ions. And this repulsion is the result of the electrons of oppositely charged ions repelling each other. So this would be seen as an endothermic term. So what we're showing is that Oh, slightly wiggly, but we get the point, that the closer our ions are to each other, we get to a point where the electrons of the individual ions start to repel, even though they're oppositely charged. So we've got two opposing forces here. So if we put these two graphs together, there's going to be a balance between the repulsion and the attraction such that a minimum energy exists, an equilibrium, which defines the actual optimum distance between two oppositely charged ions. And we see that the graph or the plot looks a little like so. So the minimum energy corresponds with the optimal distance between the sodium and the chloride ion. 
So remember at this point, we're still just talking about one ion pair, one sodium ion and one chloride ion. What happens when we scale it up? Because when we scale it up, we're not just talking about attraction and repulsion um, in terms of one ion, one sodium ion, one chloride ion. In a lattice, obviously, we've got millions and millions of ions. Sodium ions surrounded by chloride ions, surrounded by sodium ions, and so on. So what we find if we carry out the reaction and we react sodium ions with chloride ions to form our lattice, it's a highly exothermic reaction somewhere in the region of minus 790 kilojoules per mole. So clearly, on balance, the attractive interactions massively outweigh any repulsions between ions of like charge. So we can determine the enthalpy change of the formation of a lattice experimentally, but we can also calculate a value for it theoretically. Now, in some cases, the two are very, very similar, sodium chloride or potassium chloride, for example. But in other cases, um, I'm thinking maybe of silver iodide or thallium bromide, the difference between the experimental lattice energy and the theoretical is huge. Why might that be? What are the limitations of our ionic lattice model? The ionic lattice model that we've described assumes that there is zero electron density between the ionic nuclei. It falls to zero. But we can see, even in the case of what we would assume to be a very ionic compound, lithium fluoride, that isn't the case. We can see here contours showing quite clearly that there is some, it might be a very small amount, but some electron density between ionic nuclei. We should also note that the contours around the lithium ions, this one is lithium, are not completely circular, which is telling us that there is some attraction of the electron density of the lithium ion by the much larger fluoride ion. So what we're saying is that there is a small degree of covalent character within our bonding. The model also assumes that the radius of an ion is always the same regardless of the compound. So lithium ions have a set ionic radius regardless of whether it's lithium fluoride, lithium chloride, lithium bromide, lithium sulfate. This isn't actually true. The radius of an ion depends to a small degree on the way the lattice is packed. So lattices that we are really familiar with, um, so this is our classic sodium chloride lattice, but there are many, many ways to arrange ions in a lattice, and I've got some other examples here. So the packing of ions in the lattice, the 3D regular arrangement, will have some effect on the ionic radius. So as I mentioned, um, silver iodide, thallium bromide are examples of ionic compounds where the experimental and theoretical values for the lattice energy um, are really quite different. And they're different in a way that the experimental lattice energy is far greater than the theoretical. The lattice is stronger in reality than we would expect just from doing our calculations. Now, when we calculate the lattice energy, so we're talking here about the exothermic value for this reaction here. I never leave myself quite enough room. Let's just squeeze that in. We know that it's going to be exothermic. And as I said, for silver iodide, thallium bromide, it is more exothermic in reality than we would expect just from looking at the lattice. So when we do the calculations, we assume that we have got only electrostatic ionic interactions between our ions in the lattice. If experimentally our lattice is stronger than we would expect, then that's telling me that the attractions within the lattice are stronger. And again, this is more evidence that we've got significant covalent character in 
our silver iodide bond, for example, more than would be expected given that it's an ionic compound. So how can we explain this? Well, if we think about an iodide ion, for example, it's a very large ion just with a single negative charge. In this example here, I've got aluminium iodide. Aluminium is a small ion with a high charge. So we can say that aluminium has got a high charge density, would be the posh way of explaining this. Iodide ions have a low charge density. So that minus one charge is spread out over a large ionic radius. We know that compounds between ions that are small and highly charged and ions which have a low charge density have a fairly significant degree of covalent character. Aluminium iodide is a good example. Why is this? Because the iodide ion is highly polarizable. You know how much we like to make up new words in chemistry. So the iodide ion is polarized. So the electron density in that iodide ion, think of the electron density, the electrons are moving around all the time, a bit like a cloud of bees. Can you get a cloud of bees? Yeah, cloud of bees. Um, it's being attracted very strongly by the close proximity of my aluminium ion, small, high charge, high charge density. And that in itself is showing us that we've got some covalent character electron density being pulled so that it exists between the ionic nuclei. Another way to think about this is in terms of electronegativity, the ability of an atom to attract a shared pair of electrons. Uh, and we can summarize what I'm going to say talk about now in a bond type diagram, which is what this triangle is. So top of my triangle, I've got an ionic bond down here. I've got a covalent bond and over here on the left, a metallic bond. This axis represents the average electronegativity of the two elements in our bond. So average um, electronegativity of two elements. And this axis here represents the difference in electronegativity between the two elements in our bond. So a difference in electronegativity of the two elements. Okay, so if for example, I am thinking of something like cesium fluoride, there is a huge difference in electronegativity between cesium and fluorine. Fluorine is very electronegative, very good at pulling electrons towards itself. Cesium, not so much. So if I were to plot it on my triangle, it would come up somewhere like so. Uh, aluminium oxide, again, um, slightly less difference in electronegativity between the aluminium and the oxygen, I might expect aluminium oxide to be about there on my triangle. If I take two elements with very similar electronegativity, for example, the uh, molecule composed of a chlorine and three fluorine, then I would expect that to turn up down there on my triangle. So if both elements have the high electronegativity, the compound tends to be covalent. If we've got a big difference in electronegativity between two elements, our compound tends to be ionic. And if both elements have a low electronegativity, let's take potassium and sodium, for example, then I'm going to have an alloy where the bonding is metallic. So what this bond type diagram is trying to show us is that we shouldn't really be thinking of ionic metallic covalent bonding as exclusive categories, but more of a continuum. If this has been useful, hit the subscribe button, the effortless way to support your studies. And by clicking the link in the blurb below, it will take you straight to the Crunch Chemistry School.
where you'll find all the resources you need to get that A-star grade at A-level. Together we can do this.